From the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center and Understanding Evolution, this is the Evolution in the News story for November 2009. I'm Kristen Jenkins. Sometimes scientists want to ask really big questions, like how has life changed over the last three billion years? Questions like this often require more information and data than a single researcher or even a lab group can generate. But scientists can tackle these big questions by bringing together a group of people with different research specialties. The National Evolutionary Synthesis Center, or NESEN, supports this kind of work by providing funding and a location for scientists to come together. These working groups are challenging since scientists must first learn about each other's work and then determine how best to address the questions they are interested in with the various tools and methods they have as a group. The payoff for this effort can be spectacular. A recent working group at Nescent wanted to study how body sizes have changed over the history of life. Together, the group represented experience in a variety of areas ranging from mass extinctions to recent mammalian evolutionary trends. First, they compiled and analyzed a very large data set of fossil records. Among the many interesting results was a striking distribution of body size, which showed two enormous jumps rather than the gradual increase which had been predicted. These jumps correlated with two major increases in atmospheric oxygen, but also with the evolution of eukaryotic cells and multicellular organisms. We talked with some of the scientists in this group about this new data on evolutionary trends in body sizes, why body size is important, and what questions they will investigate next. To begin with, we asked Dr. Jennifer Stempian and Dr. Jonathan Payne to talk about why the working group chose to look at body size, what questions they were asking, and what their research tells us about how evolution works. So size is a trait that we can easily pick out um, from animals and plants, and not only within a certain group of animals and plants, but we can compare that size from something very small to something that's very large, from a small bacteria all the way up to a, to a larger tree. And why animals and plants have these different sizes is basically the interaction of, of not only their environment, but also their internal workings and their evolutionary history. And what I've been interested in has been a lot of how size, size patterns and how size will go maybe up and down depending on a lot of um, environmental influences on specifically um, bivalves. And so my, my research on body size has come out really of work that I've been doing on the end Permian mass extinction, which was a an interval of time about 250 million years ago when as many as 90 or 95 percent of marine species went extinct in a very short period of time. And one of the phenomena that we see associated with that extinction is a dramatic reduction in the maximum size and probably also the average size of marine snails. And so I was interested very specifically in what the mechanisms were that caused particularly the larger species to go extinct at this time. And that led me then toward more general questions of what might be controlling the evolution of body size at other times in Earth history. So in both of our cases, we've been looking at very small time scales, maybe only about five to 10 million years, um, whether it's been an extinction event, um, as John works on, or in my case, an environmental change that is affecting maybe food supply. But one of the rarities is that we don't have an understanding on how size for life as a whole on this planet has changed through time as the planet has changed. And so now we go from these time scales of about five to 10 million years, which is a long time, to about, we go back as far back as three billion and, and kind of capturing how size of, of animals and just life on this planet has um, have changed through this immense uh, history. And so that's been one of the exciting things about our working group is that we've had the chance to bring together people with a wide variety of expertise in terms of what types of organisms they study and what time intervals they study in the fossil record and also in the modern world. And our goal is to use things that we can see in the modern world that we can't necessarily see in the fossil record 
to help us better understand mechanisms in the fossil record, but also then to use the fossil record to understand the kinds of processes that happen over time scales that we just can't observe in the modern world because they're much too long. And so that's one of the great things about size, is that it's a trait that we can easily pick out from our fossil record that also equals a trait that we can easily see in our modern world. We talked with Dr. Felisa Smith and Dr. Seth Finnegan about their research and how it relates to changes in body size and evolution. The focus of my research is on body size, as it turns out. I'm interested in the causes and consequences of being a certain size. The body size of an animal um, or a plant is, is particularly important because it sort of sets the biological stage for everything. Um, a, a great deal of, of fundamental life history processes scale the size, for example. So if, if you know the, even the body size of something, you can predict things like how much energy it's going to use, how many babies it's going to have in a year. You can even predict the size of things that are likely to eat it. So it, it's really a very um, funda fundamental and, um, I think, in many ways, informative character. So that's the reason that I particularly have been interested in size. I think that um, the other thing that's really interesting about it is it turns out that because all of these really interesting and important physiological and life history and ecological things scale with size, size changes over time because in many ways it's the easiest way to adapt to a new evolutionary environment. Um. Yeah, and I, I guess the best, boy, the, the best way to relate um, w my interests to uh, Felicia's would be to say, first of all, that um, I tend to work on time scales where it's, it's very hard to make the sorts of, of detailed comparisons that, that uh, Felice is interested in, but where we potentially deal with, with environmental change, changes uh, that are, are of much greater magnitude. Um, and so my interest is in more in, in looking at the sort of ecosystem perspective. My research focuses more on the development of marine ecosystems. Doctors Finnegan and Smith explain the group's striking observations about body size and atmospheric oxygen levels and how this relates to important evolutionary changes, such as the evolution of eukaryotic cells and multicellular organisms that occurred about the same time. Yeah, when you look at that overall scale and you plot time versus size, what you see is enormous period almost of evolutionary stasis where size is only varying by maybe one or two orders of magnitude for, for mm -hmm. tens or even hundreds of millions of years. And then these really in geologically abrupt jumps of right. almost eight orders of magnitude. And they're jumps, but, they're, you know, but then they, 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 they plateau or, or nearly right. plateau very quickly, which implies that essentially you're overcoming some sort of barrier, environmental or physiological or ecological or, or most likely sort of all three at once. Um, but then very quickly, in geological time at least, you sort of explore the full range of, of body sizes allowed by that breakthrough and you sort of start bumping up against a ceiling. That's right. Um, so right. that was interesting and, and certainly the, the fact that this as best we can tell, appears to coincide with these two major steps in increase in, in atmospheric oxygen level. Um, is very interesting because there are many reasons to think that oxygen, if it doesn't limit body size, certainly um, interacts in a very complex way in, with, with determining the body size of an organism. Doctors Richard Krauss and Michal Kovalevsky explain how oxygen levels on Earth have changed over time. Um, the Earth was very different in the first million, a billion years or so, and that was uh, largely based on the rock record that really indicated that there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, no free ox oxygen at least. And we then noticed, or geologists noticed, that there is a remarkable coincidence between the uh, abundant appearance of stromatolites, which are, which probably formed with contribution of algae, and oxygenation of the atmosphere. And so it was not a big leap to tie the oxygenation process of the hydrosphere and the atmos atmosphere to um, photosynthetic bacteria, photosynthetic cyanobacteria, which are the very simple bacteria like algae which were probably the first really abundant organisms that produced uh, oxygen in large quantities. So 
there is a I th there are other mechanisms by which oxygen may have been produced in non-biological mechanisms mm -hmm. for producing oxygen. Okay. But by far, most of the evidence indicates that, like today in modern um, sort of on modern Earth, uh, the, bio uh, the biosphere was the primary source of oxygen through uh, oxygenetic photosynthesis as the primary source. So that was the first big jump that not only actually uh, changed the chemistry of the Earth, but also probably was the primary trigger that allowed for the evolution of eukaryotic cells. And it provides a nice symmetry because you have some of the smallest organisms setting mm -hmm. the upper bound for the largest organisms in a way. Dr. Krauss explains some of the other research questions the group is addressing with the data set. One of our current projects is um, taking this, this sort of graph that we have of maximum size through time and splitting it out according to different groups and sort of asking the, the secondary question, um, well, what was the largest fish at any given time? Or what was the largest mollusk at any given time? And mm -hmm. so this is something that all of us can, I think, contribute a lot more to um, because, you know, we all have data sets on these specific groups and um, we can sort of add to the data set in that way. And so we're going to get an idea of not only what was the maximum size through time, but like who was the largest organism at any given time. You know, at some points during the past it might have been a fish. Um, and at other times it might have been um, a, an arthropod or something like that. So I think that all of our, our research can sort of inform that. Dr. Kovalevsky talked about how his research fits in with the working group. You know, when, when people ask me about what I actually do for a living, I typically like to answer that my goal is to quantify the history of life. So simply put some numbers on various data that we can extract from the fossil record. And our first paper that came out from that, it's exactly that type of pattern. We, we were able to quantify very specifically how the maximum body size of organisms changed mm -hmm over the entire history of recorded, recorded history of life, and that's pretty exciting. And Doctors Craig McLean and Allison Boyer talked about some of the big questions that remain about evolution and body size. I think for me one of the still the outstanding questions is whether, what, what are the things that really limit the, how big an organism can get? You know, are, if we allow more time to progress, are we going to get something bigger than the blue whale, or is that as, as big as life can get on Earth? Is that, is that the maximum extent? That's exactly the question that popped to my mind. And, by, and you can think about this in terms of other organisms as well, like um, snails, you know, our snail, the biggest snail was probably about this large, and, and the question is, 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 that advice, yeah, is that the biggest a snail can possibly right. get? You know, is there something about having a shell on your back, the weight of the shell, the way that you construct a shell, you know, or, or the fact that you have to produce this kind of slime trail to, to navigate on, you know, and the, and the sort of expense of making this, is, is it that is pretty much as big as you can get? Right, well, that's something that, another question that arose, um, the largest clam is the giant clam, and it's like a meter long. Mm -hmm. But the reason why the giant clam is so big is because it actually incorporates uh, plants algae cells into its own body and it exposes that to the sun which allows it to collect more energy. Right. So it's actually become the giant clam because it uses the sun and it's acting like a plant. So maybe in order to grow a lot larger organisms would have to dramatically change their, right. their And the giant clam body. doesn't have to move around to find its food right. supply it either. It just stays in one place. So if you look at like the largest worm it has done the same thing. So worms don't get very big because they, they, if in order for a worm to work, like an earthworm or a marine worm to work, they have to be, they have to limit their size or else that pulsing motion they, they use to move doesn't really work very well. But the largest worm is actually a worm that doesn't move and it's done a very similar thing. It lives near hydrothermal vents and it takes, and it has a special organ that houses bacteria in it that are able to convert methane and carbon dioxide in the water into a usable sugar. So it doesn't have to go anywhere to find its food either. All it has to do is sit there and eat. Right. And so when you have an eff effective strategy like that, that allows you to sort of escape these constraints. And knowing the, I think, so the questions are sort of, when do these, ex when do these things occur and what drives those? And is it always a similar thing? Do you, 
in order to escape a body size, do you, this body size constraint, do you always have to have some sort of symbiosis with algae or right. you know bacteria? Or invent a completely new way of living right. to break those previous constraints. Yeah, and of course if you create a whole new way, then that begs the question of at what point, do, you know, in the case of a snail, if you come up with a whole new way of doing something, maybe, maybe you're not a snail at all anymore. Maybe you're something new now. Maybe that's why we have have cephalopods, octopuses, and giant squids, essentially. Mm -hmm. That was their escape. Our group still has a lot of questions to answer, mm -hmm. but that's just part of science. And that's the, that's the really fantastic part of science is asking a set of questions, figuring out just a piece of the puzzle, but knowing there's still more waiting for you. For more information about this story, including links to primary and popular literature and classroom resources, visit the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center website or the Understanding Evolution website. More stories are available in the Evolution in the News archives on either site. The National Evolutionary Synthesis Center is funded by the National Science Foundation to promote research in biological evolution.